This first session is about origins of creativity. My name is Nicola Bonacci. I'm Italian. I've been living here in Portugal for, for ages. I am a faculty here at ISPA. I'm a neuroscientist. But in my previous life, I used to be a street performer and circus artist. So I, I feel I'm living the art and science dilemma. And most of the time, I feel like a hidden artist pretending to do science. But that's beside the point. So we'll have three speakers today. We'll, we'll talk about 15 to 20 minutes each. And we'll start with uh, Leo Fuzani. And uh, Professor Fuzani is an ornithologist and animal physiologist. He has uh, ex extensive international experience and currently holds the position of uh, Professor of Animal Physiology and Ornithology at the University of Veterinary Medicine in Vienna uh, since 2014. Uh, Professor Fosani was also chair of the Committee of European Societies for Behavioral Biology and a fellow of the International Ornithologist Union. Uh, he has authored uh, numerous papers in peer-reviewed journals and plays a crucial role in, as a reviewer for research uh, worldwide. So Professor Fosani's research focuses on courtship displays, animal migration and aesthetics of animals and provides a lot of insight into avian behavior. His work has been supported by a lot of institutions such as the Max Planck Society, the NGS, the NSF, and has, uh, has brought him all around the world, including Equatorial Africa, Central America, and the Himalayas. Which I've never been, I want to be there. I want to go there. Uh, his work in this area has earned him a prestigious Frank A. Beach Award from the Society for Behavioral Neuroendocrinology in 2007. And today he'll talk about Aesthetics, creativity, evolution, and tool use. Without further ado, please welcome. Thank you. Well, so, so first of all, thank I want to thank Rui and Ishpa for inviting me here today, and you for being here, and Nico for the introduction. And um, let me start my presentation. So this is just like a. Uh, a they always tell me that I always have to remember that, to remind people that I'm actually in two different institutions. I have a <laughs> double appointment, like otherwise they are, they are jealous of each other. So, um, as I said, I have a, I have a double appointment and uh, at two universities. And in fact, I mean, a little bit, my, my research and my activities are uh, divided between the two universities. Uh, and the work I'm going to present today is actually what I'm doing at the Department of Behavioral and Cognitive Biology. So, modern biology is based on the theories uh, that uh, Charles Darwin uh, wrote, conceived in the, uh, in the uh, middle of the uh, 19th century. And I think everybody, even people who are not scientists, know about the theory of evolution by, uh, through natural selection, uh, so which is the, the unitary theory of uh, biological science nowadays. I always get upset when people tell me, or people mention like, a, uh, you know, hard science like physics and is a hard science and biology is not. We have a unitary theory. We have, it's a very hard science. We, everything we do is based on a unitary theory. So the, this concept of like biology not being hard science is completely fake. But uh, Darwin, after writing this book, uh, it did, did, did not really sleep well. Why? He had recurrent nightmares. He writes to his friends and colleagues, I have nightmares every time I see a peacock tail. The reason for that is that uh, the theory of uh, evolution by natural selection is based on the fact that you, um, animals have evolved uh, in a way as to improve survival, the survival of the fittest. This is like you know, the common ideas about natural selection. So why would a tail, like a, the tail of a people, help you to survive? No way. It's big. It make, makes you more busy, uh, visible to predators. It's heavy. It's expensive to build. So that cannot be explained by natural selection. In fact, Darwin wrote a second book. Uh, about 15 years afterwards, which is about the origin of man. This is the, the, the book that actually put him in travels. 
And he had to conceive a different uh, second theory, which is like uh, selection in relation to sex, also to explain our origin. So the theory of uh, selection, uh, sexual selection, as we call it today, is based on a very simple logic. So any trait that give us an advantage in reproduction, getting more sons, will be will evolve if the benefits are higher than the cost. So uh, if a trait that make me more attractive to partners, uh, give me more offspring, more sons, more descendants, then this trait will evolve, even if it's expensive from the point of view of natural selection. And this, Darwin wrote about that, and for a long time this uh, idea was not abandoned, but was not really empirically studied. And the first study was done in the in the 80s, and I just mentioned it to you to, 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 so that you, you can understand how this works. So basically, you know, this is, a, this is an African bird, it's called a widow bird, and uh, the tail, the long tail of these birds have no function at all. The only function is to make them more attractive to females. And Anderson made one of the first experiments where he took a, a group of males, you see them here, so these are different groups of males, and this is another nest. So these animals are polygamous, so they have uh, uh, many females with which they are paired. And so these are the, the, the group of birds before the experiment, and then Anderson took like the scissors and glue, and then he went to the field, and then he cut the tail of a group of birds. The, the, the feathers, of course, is like our hair, so there is no no pain, you can cut them, there is no damage to the animals, right? So he cut the, hair, the, the tail of a group of animals, of birds, and glued the tail to this one, so that the tail was longer. And what you, you can see after the experiments, that there were also two control groups, uh, where in this group the tail was cut and glued it back again, and these other animals were untouched, unmanipulated. What well, you can see that the males with a very long tail became very attractive. They increased the number of females that they were mated with. <coughs> so this was the first demonstration. But interestingly, Anderson also wrote this and said, Darwin seemed to assume similar sense of beauty in, a, in other higher vertebrates as in man. But this assumption, right or wrong, is not necessary for female choice. Discrimination among males in relation to size, shape, color, or others should suffice. So the message is, Darwin told, wrote in his books that animals are, uh, males charm the females, and the, the animals must have an aesthetic sense uh, to be able to enjoy and appreciate the, the tail of the people. But Anderson was saying, well, it's not really necessary. You know, you measure the, how long the tail is, that's enough. You, you measure how brilliant this color is using a spectrophotometer, that's enough. And in a very influential review, a few af uh, years after, uh, then John Serratman wrote that the flavor of Darwin's argument for female choice may represent one of the largest shortcomings of his treatment of sexual selection, because it gave the impression that animals would need a human-like sense of aesthetics for sexual selection to operate. And this is the dominant view nowadays. We don't need to have an aesthetic sense for animals, which it's just enough to put together like some combination of color, length, uh, you know, other traits, and we can explain why some males are preferred uh, compared to other ones. But not everybody was impressed, as convinced, especially people working with these magnificent, ma magnificent animals like birds of paradise, they have these beautiful plumages, they have all these different colors, they do the displays. Fogelkop, uh, um, uh, Bowerbird. When these, these constructions were discovered by an Italian naturalist in the beginning of the 19th century in New Guinea, and he spent several weeks looking for the people who built that. And somebody told him, the birds did that. So this has been built by a bird, by a Bowerbird. And, the, and they, they, these structures are not built for nesting or for sleeping or for, for nothing else than to be attractive. And how can you reduce this attractiveness of, of beauty definition just simply by counting the number of objects or like a, 
deciding if blue is better than, I don't know, pink, or the construction of the bar. There is no simple way to measure this. So all the people who work with very complex, elaborate displays in this case, they thought, mm, there is, must be something more. There, is, must, there must be something more than simply you know, measuring things. And the same is Bauerwitz. Bauerwitz have this, uh, they build this little bower, and then they, they stand in front of the, this bower when the female is inside. Probably they build it uh, to make sure that the females are not too scared when they are doing their uh, show, because the show is a little bit aggressive in some way. And so they, they use the collected objects like plastic uh, rings and whatever, they throw them in the air. They really make a show, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I was very interested in that. So about 20 years ago, uh, I, after finishing my uh, PhD, my first postdoc, I, I joined a lab in, in UC, at UCLA uh, uh, with the Barney Schlinger, who was working on mannequins. Uh, this is a uh, golden color mannequins. So mannequins are the people, are the little acrobats in the uh, uh, bird world. They do acrobacies, they, they make noise, they have modified wings, uh, modified bones. They, everything in their body is shaped to become uh, acrobatically very, uh, very strong. And uh, I'll show you a video of this work to give you an impression of the display of this mannequin. So this, the, all, they do that only to, uh, to attack the female. The female is the, the bird, uh, the green bird moving around. The male is the one with the yellow beard. And, and they do that uh, for, for days, uh, many hours per day. In this, groups of, uh, in this group of species, uh, they, 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 they have a, a mating system which is called LEP. So our mating system, social mating system, in, is in Western society is monogamous, right? There's a pair, a man, and a woman. In other cultures, there is polygamy, a man and many women, or like uh, there is polygyny, you know, a woman and many men, or, or like that. It, in the lack mating system, the male only show himself. There is no contribution to the offspring. The male is there, is dancing, the female comes, choose the best male, and then they go somewhere else, they lay the eggs, they raise the youngs. The male has zero contribution, only the DNA, only the sperm, no other contribution. So everything is focused on choosing the best actor, the best dancer. How do they do that? And when I was thinking about that, of course, uh, this is a female with a nest. You know, I was thinking, okay, we know now that many of these traits are important for like, preference. We know that female preferred mates that have very brilliant colors. We know that they, they, they prefer the mates which are in the center of the leg. We know that they like, you know, bigger ones and the ones that have big motor skills and so on. Uh, for example, then you could say, well, then what they do is like, you know, gym, uh, like a judge of a gymnast competition. They look at the different, like, uh, skills, how good they are. Again, I was not convinced. So then we started looking uh, at choreography. And then we said, OK, maybe there is something in the way they do their dances. So we, we developed together with a company in Vienna a complex system to be able to do a 3D uh, motion capture in the field. And so this was my uh, PhD student unit. Uh, it was very complicated because if you do motion capture in a studio, you put markers on the body and you have cameras and the walls, and it's very easy to follow the movement. But if you do that in the, in the forest with wild birds, with no markers, it's much more complicated. But we were successful, and you can see here, like uh, these are the three synchronized cameras, the same animals dancing over there. And then after a lot of work of, with artificial intelligence and machine learning, we were able actually to automatically to teach the computer to track the movement of the bird. And then eventually, uh, you know, we could like reconstruct the movement of the bird in, in the dance. So exactly the, the choreography, how the, the, the animals were moving around. And so then we added also this component. Choreography is also important. But if I put this all together and I think, okay, how would female evaluate these displays? Do they go one by one? Do they look at each single component one by one? 
He seems to be not very likely, honestly. So I think that the females go for a uh, integrated value. So for something that brings everything together. And as we, when we look at the dance show, just to use an easy analogy, we appreciate the whole show. We can then spend time discussing about the clothes, the music, uh, the, uh, the movements of the dancer, but at the end we appreciate the entire show. We, our aesthetic experience is the entire show, not the single components. So I think that this is also what uh, the females of these uh, birds do. They, have a, they, they, they actually extract an aesthetic value from the performance, right? And so this is the beginning of my story, because when I, I started thinking about that, um, that was a few years ago, and many people didn't like us biologists to use this term aesthetic. Why? Because some, many people, many people in the, in the human, in the humanities, think that aesthetic is really the last barrier between humans and the other animals. It's something that makes us different. There were many discoveries showing that animals have morality, that any, animals have sociality. So the last barrier is for many aesthetics. And um, I think that the problem is what they wrote, John Cervato and Manet, that they say they human-like sense of aesthetic. We don't need to find a human-like sense of aesthetic. We, we need to find a bird-like sense of aesthetic, or animal-like sense of aesthetic, something that is specific to each different species of taxon. So with this idea, uh, together with uh, um, Victorio Gallese, who's a neuroscientist, a neuroesthetician, so he studies how our brain reacts to paintings of different artists. And they look at the brain, how the brain is activated, and you know, what kind of painting induced what kind of reaction in our brain. Something that in animals we still cannot do. But we organized together this uh, first workshop in Sicily, and we invited many people from anthropology, from philosopher. Um, it was a disaster. There was no communication. We almost killed each other. Okay? Because, because the problem is that many people thought that there would be a kind of a, 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 another reduction in attempt of biologists come in strong with their unitary theory, with the, uh, with the Darwinian theory, and say, we can explain human behavior with our theories. Right? And, but this is not what is moving me and other people. To, to think about something, to reason, to do science, we need words. And we need to uh, be able to, to speak about things. And I think that what we are missing in the biology in biological world is a language to talk about aesthetics. So this is why I'm looking for uh, to reach out to people in humanities, in, in the arts, to try to develop a common language. Can we use a can we use a terminology, a language with which we can explain cer certain aspects of uh, let's say of beauty, of uh, of aesthetic experience that can be like common between animals and uh, humans. There was a second meeting in 2017 in, in, uh, in uh, Zagreb, uh, this, uh, organized by a philosopher. And this was much more, much more constructive. We kind of made uh, some progress there, uh, discussing about you know, the, if uh, a, a aesthetic is uh, possible, it can, we, if we can talk about aesthetics in, 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 in animals. I just want to give you some example why uh, there are so many things pushing this direction. Uh, the great power birds. I showed you before the power birds. Now, there was an amazing discovery a few years ago for which like, it was found out that, uh, that um, power birds create false perspectives. So they basically, they combine the little stones in front of the bower so that they, there is a, a false perspective. So they look bigger. The female is sitting inside the bower and they look as the male. The male looks bigger than he is because of this false perspective. I'm pretty sure you know that, the, the, uh, the, the example I will show you later on. And John Handler, the author, writes there. He's a I met him uh, one month ago. I was in Australia. He's based in Australia. We met there, and he said, yeah, this was very provocative. But I wanted to induce a reaction. And so he says, visual art can be defined as the creation of an external visual pattern by one individual in order to influence the behavior of others. Judgment is the active choice among different art objects or individuals leading to change in fitness in both the artist 
and the judge. And aesthetics is the exercise of judgment leading to mutual fitness changes. So the operation definition of art, judgment, and aesthetics suggests that great Bowerbirds are artists and have an aesthetic sense. <laughs> it's a very provocative statement, but he did so because like, he wanted to move uh, the, you know, so he wanted to induce some reaction in people. Again, there were many, I'm not alone, there are many people thinking about that. Uh, for example, uh, Rick Pram a few years ago, a Yale professor, wrote this uh, evolution of beauty, and his idea is basically that it, even in, the, in nature, um, beauty is evolving as a co-evolution between a, like a producer, the, 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 the organisms producing the, the beautiful trait, and the chooser, the, the, the other individual that is choosing this trait. And they only, there is no only mating, there is no only uh, the, a display of the courtship. There are other examples, like for example, like pollination. <coughs> Why do flowers exist? They exist to attract pollinators. They exist to attract animals that will choose these flowers to feed on this flower and then disperse the seeds around. There is no reason for flower to exist. If not for attracting bees and, and hummingbirds and other animals. You know, there will be no uh, flowers in the world if it was not for this reason. So again, this is a coevolution. Flowers tend to be more beautiful, more uh, odorful, to attract animals to them. It's, it's uh, attractive. It, there is always a, a, like a competition between the flower and the bee, the flower and the hummingbird. So again, uh, promised by Writes, I propose that art consists of a form of communication that co-evolves with its evaluation, so evolves in relation with and in response to its evaluation. I argue that many previously proposed anthropocentric requirements for art fail to exclude various non-human biotic advertisements. As Darwin proposed, I conclude that many animals share with humans the capacity for aesthetic agency, the state of participating in the process of aesthetic expression, evaluation, judgment, and change. And eventually, a couple of years ago, I was able to get money to study this uh, mm -hmm. from, like, I convinced uh, uh, like, uh, the uh, Vienna uh, Science and Technology Fund. I joined forces with a psychologist who is an expert in human, uh, like, uh, visual uh, aesthetics, empirical aesthetics. He studied, like, attractiveness in humans. And we started looking at parallel mechanisms. We want to understand if Given that, of course, human culture has changed the way we are and we progressed uh, in a much more complex way, do we have similar basic processes to, uh, to do an aesthetic evaluation? Some of the th we know already that this is true in some way. Symmetry, uh, equilibrium, fluency, these are components that are important also in the uh, aesthetic evaluation in humans. But, so this is the intention, not to find a way to explain human arts or human aesthetics with the animal research. It's to try to, fit, to, to find if there are common mechanisms that derive, that are hardwired in our brain, which is very ancient and has a lot of, of, course, of commonality with the animal brain. And I choose, of course, like Leda and the Swan by Leonardo da Vinci as a perfect like, a way to represent our intents in life. So with that, I want to just to show you a valuable display to show you, you know, what these uh, males do to try to charm the females. And to me, this can be explained by simply measuring the length of a feather, right? <coughs> Thank him by you know, funding aid uh, bodies and agency, and thank you for the attention. Our next speaker is Jean. Is Professor Jean Zillion. Uh, professor Zillion is uh, a Paleolithic archaeology professor. Is it correct? Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> and uh, uh, he has an incredible career uh, 
playing around, uh, playing around, uh, making a mark on our understanding of human history. He's a PI and professor of Paleolithic Archaeology at the University of Lisbon, and he has uh, uh, not only looked at the prehistory of of, uh, of humans, uh, but also uh, he holds he hold or holds a position in the several international universities like the University of Bristol, Paris One, Bordeaux University, and more recently Barcelona. Uh, his contributions are significant. He has uh, more papers than I can count, <laughs> and uh, uh, numerous book contributions. Uh, and his work has been celebrated internationally, earning him several prizes, such as the Humboldt Foundation Research Award and the Europa Prize from the London Prehistoric Society. It, in, in Portugal, he actually was Director General of the Portuguese Institute of Archaeology uh, as the Ministry of Culture. In, from 97 to 2002, right after his experience as a director of the Coa Valley Archaeological Park, where he was instrumental in the recognition of the Paleolithic rock art as the World Heritage Site. Uh, and Professor Zilian's work showcases the profound connection between art and creativity and the ancient past. So I would invite him to give him his presentation. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, Thank you to Rui Ispa for the invitation. It's my pleasure to uh, share with you some thoughts uh, derived from my mostly field experience. We are, as I, I'm an archaeologist in the fullest sense of the word, so a very down-to-earth <laughs> <laughs> person who likes to have his ideas grounded uh, in um, in, in data and, uh, and evidence. <coughs> and uh, before becoming an archaeologist, I was a, a speleologist, so a, a proper caveman. Uh, and, uh, and that is why uh, <coughs> a lot of my work has been uh, conducted in, in, in cave sites. So um, <coughs> I think the question that, uh, that brings us uh, here together today uh, is, is basically the following. Uh, is the paradigm that has uh, dominated uh, the field of uh, human origins and, and uh, origins of uh, modern humans, modern cognition, modern people, modern etc. Uh, correct as it stood uh, the uh, test of time and of uh, discoveries carried out over the last quarter of a century, and my <coughs> uh, answer to that is uh, no, it hasn't, and we have to think about these issues in a very different manner, not very differently from what we just heard um, <coughs> from the previous speaker, and, and I, I guess that there will be a lot of common ground uh, <coughs> with what uh, we just heard. So basically the question is that uh, how do we uh, uh, study or, 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 or investigate this issue uh, when, uh, in the absence of writing, uh, all we have to look into are proxies? Uh, when, <coughs> when, and, and the proxies that we use, material proxies, those that leave uh, a record, uh, uh, brains do not fossilize, but behavior does. So we can look at the, the, the that's the role of archaeology in this debate, or in paleontology, is look at stuff that exists today, inherited from the past, and try to learn from that what it is that, uh, the, the, those, that evidence is telling it. And obviously, uh, the, the, the starting point for this uh, line of inquiry is that when you see uh, something like this, something like that, something like that, or something like that, we don't even ask the question uh, whether these people, even if they had no writing, had brains like uh, our own, uh, spoke uh, with languages like our own, and basically were people like us, right? Uh, but <coughs> what about before those times? And uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, proxies that uh, archaeologists and, you know, Paleoanthropologists, people interested in human evolution, 
came up with uh, related to what is called art, uh, in the sense that uh, 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 being a communica communication using symbols, uh, it required uh, 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 language and therefore uh, uh, the basic human, the basic thing that theoretically uh, discriminates or separates between humans and the rest of the animal world. world. And this was put together in the context of the mitochondrial hypothesis, according to which uh, recent uh, uh, humans were a recent, or people like us, Homo sapiens, were a recent uh, development in evolutionary terms. And uh, uh, <coughs> uh, all, all of us alive today descended from uh, a um, small African population who th that had undergone the process of speciation in Africa some 200,000 years ago and later on developed cognition, perhaps following a second uh, mutation event that would have uh, given the capacity for language. And everybody else alive in planet Earth, namely the Neanderthals, who became the linchpin uh, uh, around which this uh, debate uh, evolved, uh, were essentially non-human in that regard. And this was the so-called human revolution. I uh, the criteria to establish the presence of, uh, uh, in, in, so in, in the absence of stuff like this, right? The criteria were uh, personal ornaments, depictions, graphical representations of any kind, controllers of fire, because that would imply uh, some degree of sophisticated technology. That in, in fact, is producing something that does not exist naturally um, at your own uh, will. And uh, this was associated with the notion that uh, uh, living off uh, marine foods uh, would be the key to understand how the, the physiological mechanisms through which uh, 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 the brain set become uh, more complex and more capable given the, you know, the uh, richness in you know, fatty acids and stuff. And all of this was supposed to come together in southern Africa about 100,000 years ago and would explain why these populations uh, became um, superior, so to speak, and eventually spread across the entire world, replacing, leading, leading, leading to the extinction of uh, everybody else, including the uh, so this was the story. And it's just based on uh, the finding of stuff like this perforated <coughs> shells in sites in the Near East, uh, the uh, uh, finding of in sites in Southern Africa of uh, uh, graphic representations of, uh, of uh, 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 shells used uh, as containers for the preparation of uh, uh, pigment, and the uh, uh, presence of shell midden sites uh, with large heaps of uh, food refuse uh, documenting the consumption of uh, mollusks and fish uh, at uh, uh, so far uh, back in time. And uh, the way uh, this was codified, so to speak, uh, is in a very uh, important paper to my mind that uh, synthesizes this in a very clear uh, way by Richard Klein 20 years ago exactly in science where basically he said the issue the, 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 with the Neanderthals is that they had failed to take the uh, evolution. And so the, they had, <coughs> uh, and, and that is why they had gone extinct. Just by uh, their cognitive inferiority, their lack of development, the brains that had developed in Southern Africa uh, when uh, the populations coming from the south entered Eurasia. They were just doomed to extinction. They had they did not stand a chance. Now, <coughs> basically, that's why the Neanderthals would have gone extinct. They would not be able to master such complex ways of thinking as, as we do. <coughs> now, and now I'm going to accelerate because you know you can, you can ask questions, but it's about the empirical evidence. What happens uh, ever since uh, uh, we have been able to? First, document that uh, 
Uh, Neanderthals had the high hip bone exactly like ours, so they had the uh, anatomical apparatus, as far as we can tell from, from the bones required for speaking, that their auditory uh, uh, the, the, the skeleton uh, was uh, experimentally demonstrated to be able to uh, <coughs> uh, hear exactly the same uh, kinds of sounds that uh, um, uh, we, we used to speak um, and uh, that even the so-called language gene, the fox speaking gene, was exactly the same in the and uh, uh, present day people. Then uh, uh, we also found out, first through the discovery of this uh, child skeleton in Portugal, that uh, Neanderthals and modern humans, so-called modern humans, had interbred, which by definition uh, questioned the notion that Neanderthals were a different species. Uh, <coughs> then, uh, a few years later, despite uh, <coughs> the fact that those of us who proposed the, the, this hypothesis were crucified as heretics, um, eventually the inquisitors themselves, uh, using uh, ancient DNA, were able to, to demonstrate based on our fossils, the fossils that we had excavated, like the Velazzi fossils from Romania, uh, that indeed the genomes of not only earliest apocalyptic people, but uh, present day humans as well, uh, carried the signature of that uh, systematic uh, uh, interbreeding. Uh, eventually, the archaeological side of things uh, demonstrated the same. Coastal adaptations, and this is the site in Portugal, Gruta de Figueira Brava, published in Science uh, three years ago. Uh, we demonstrated here that close to the sea of the time, we had in the sediments, in the remains found in the sediments, uh, uh, what you see here is a, a brown crab, um, dolphin, uh, these are eel bones, uh, and this is just a, a, a graphic showing that in terms of the density, these sites are richer in, in marine foods than the sites in South Africa that were used to substantiate the model uh, in the physiological mechanism for the emergence of uh, uh, modernity. We demonstrated that they were using, uh, they had a pine nut economy. Uh, then in the sites that I have excavated in Spain, we've been able to show that controlled use of fire from <coughs> through 50,000 years of archaeological sequence uh, was uh, as prevalent in the Middle Paleolithic in Neanderthal uh, as in the Upper Paleolithic. All the red lines that you see are uh, fire features. It's one of the profile, it's the other profile. So this is the, ne the Neanderthal levels below the rock fall, and these are the earliest so-called modern human levels immediately above the rock fall. And you see it's all the same, the features. These are from the Upper Paleolithic. Um, these are from the Middle Paleolithic, but it's exactly the same thing, leading to us being forced to conclude that there are only two possibilities of interpretation for this record. One is that Neanderthals had the ability to make fire at will, and the other is that they had the ability to summon lightning at will. And I, I would suggest that the uh, parsimonious hypothesis here is the first, not the second, uh, which was the hypothesis that supporters of the human revolution tended to consider the, uh, uh, perhaps they, they, as kids, they, they, they read the Quest for Fire, the famous book by uh, Rosemary and Ed, then turned into a movie, uh, where exactly uh, the, these ancient peoples uh, uh, were, were thought to, you know, be uh, always fire starved and, uh, and, and needed to uh, engage in very complicated behaviors in order to acquire it. Uh, body ornaments, uh, we just saw in the Zagreb, uh, the Zagreb uh, conference that uh, Leo showed, the uh, uh, fact and shell from Cuevo de los Aviones, which we excavated in 2007, 2008. Uh, sorry, from Cueva Anton, the site uh, that is key of, in this regard is Cuevo de los Aviones, where, remember the same shells I showed you before from the Near East, these are from uh, this site in Cartagena, Spain, associated with lots of uh, yellow pigment. This is a kind of pigment that is only, whose only industrial use known is in cosmetics. 
and it is whose only archaeological usage known is as the pigment used to do the, the, the facial, the, uh, uh, to denote uh, 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 the facial makeup of uh, um, funerary uh, statues in ancient Egypt, and only for the women, okay? Um, uh, and also the same kinds of containers used to process uh, uh, pigments with, you know, combinations of complex combinations of uh, different minerals used to produce a certain effect, and eventually we're even able to date it to um, more than 115,000 years ago, which predated by several tens of thousands of years the earliest evidence elsewhere in the world at that time. Uh, and uh, five years ago, it was also published in Science. It's a project that I started when I was at Bristol with my colleagues using uranium thorium to do uh, paleoclimatology based on, on stalagmites. Uh, we turned the technique around to look into dating calcite covering ca cave paintings. And, and uh, we, 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 you know, over a, a dozen years of sampling and analyzing, we eventually, to our honestly ex shock and surprise, uh, we're able to realize that uh, some of these paintings, namely this uh, rectangular sign, leather-like sign here, uh, at the Cave of La Pasiega, which is known for this beautiful uh, later uh, period uh, animal paintings, were very old. Uh, they dated to uh, more than 65,000 years ago. And then it was not uh, the only case, Maltravieso in the province of Cáceres, same thing, hand stones is covered by calcite, the calcite is 65,000 years old minimum. Um, Ardales, this uh, huge uh, stalagmite stalag dome, it's covered in uh, red paint. The red paint is in turn covered by calcite. When you date the calcite, you get the same result. So three different sites. Uh, and in this case, even at Ardales, we have evidence of the behavior being repeatedly uh, repeat, repeated over uh, uh, tens of thousands of years. This is not idiosyncratic, this is a feature, uh, not a bug. Of, uh, uh, now, of course, there, is, there was skepticism and controversy to be expected and natural and healthy even, because you know, when you come up with something like this that turns uh, the world upside down, or the world of certain colleagues upside down, it is expected that uh, controversy will uh, arise. Uh, there was a lot of debate, but people have been silent for the last two to three years, so uh, uh, apparently it's now uh, settled to the extent that anything can be settled in, in science. Um, the interesting thing, though, uh, is, start, is looking into uh, the, 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 the logical structure of the, of the skeptical argument. And, and a, a prominent colleague in this debate, Jean-Jacques Leblanc, who used to be the uh, head of the Max Planck in, in, in Leipzig, not the Max Planck, the, the, the genetics, the Max Planck dealing with the, with the fossils, uh, the reaction uh, was this, okay? He will not be convinced until he sees something made by a Neanderthal that can be uh, considered figurative. Uh, for the Southern African evidence, however, he's satisfied with that. Okay, so for Neanderthals, you need the Mona Lisa. <laughs> but for, for modern humans, this is enough. <laughs> now, why? So this is the question to, that to my mind is most interesting, because if you look at the definition of uh, Neanderthals as a separate species given, in 1864 by William King. And I would, I, you know, I'll, do I have, we still have five minutes? Okay, so please read, take your time, and compare to what Richard Klein wrote in Science in 2003. It's the exact same argument. That despite more than 100 years of discoveries, of empirical discoveries, the logical structure of the argument remained exactly the same. Phrenology. 
that it was pure and simple phrenological argument. Why? Well, because humans are essentially different from everything else. Yeah. And they sit at the top of the, uh, of the uh, evolutionary ladder. And even if this is no longer accepted, at least consciously, it remains in the subconscious of uh, at least paleoanthropologists, hopefully not as well as it is, but <laughs> for people studying human evolution, and, and it, is, it is still uh, the case. And basically, as applied to Neanderthals, the reasoning is also 19th century. It's blaming the victim. Why did they disappear? Because they had some in, intrinsic fault uh, that uh, condemned to uh, uh, extinction. So there is, it's the as primitive an argument as you can uh, think of. So what happened 100,000 years ago? Not just in South Africa or uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in general, but as we now know, also in Europe and, and, and most certainly also in, 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 in Eastern Asia. What happened is that uh, what I call the Middle Paleolithic Revolution, which is that you know there were, you had more people uh, on the planet than before. If you have more people, you will have more chances for interaction. More chances for interaction mean you need codes, uh, you mean rules, uh, you, need, you need a society that is uh, uh, wider than the you know the group of five or ten or fifteen people who live together on a daily basis, and this is what uh, triggers the use of uh, functions and, and, and organs that were already there uh, to start uh, producing stuff that uh, uh, was not being produced before. And that's when you see uh, burials, uh, that's when you start seeing personal ornaments, that's when you start seeing cave art, and it's all at about the same time. And uh, uh, please bear in mind that when an ar paleolithic archaeologist talks about the same time, it means an interval of 10 to 20,000 years, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <coughs> so, and uh, as uh, 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 where, where the brain, uh, the, the, the brain in, in, in is concerned, and if you are familiar with the expensive tissue hypothesis and, and with uh, Deacon's uh, The Symbolic Species book, to my mind, still the, un the unsurpassed review of uh, the co-evolution of brain and language, um, it's very simple. I mean, you cannot have, if you have that 100,000 years ago, or 150,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, the, 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 the hardware requirements that are, that are, that are called upon to produce those, these behaviors, uh, they, had to be in, they had to be in place. And in order for them to be in place, because they are put in place by Darwinian processes, which means a long time, uh, uh, it means that we have to look into uh, the, uh, the uh, origins of this stuff uh, a long, long time ago and not in, in the very recent past, which does not mean that obviously there is not an interaction between social life, cultural life, and cognition depending on what you mean by cognition, which is a, a, another complicated issue, and that the last 40,000 years, or the last 400 years, or even the last 40 years, have not had uh, an impact on how our brains work and how uh, we use language, etc. But that's uh, not an evolutionary question. And uh, the key to understand why these controversies go on is uh, what uh, I Quoting from Richard Dawkins, uh, I would say the uh, tyranny of the discontinuous mind uh, and the notion uh, that it, it eventually, ultimately, uh, uh, relates to the fact that um, we, even if uh, Darwin wrote his book more than 150 years ago, the zoologists and paleontologists continue to think in linear terms when it comes especially to the past. And of course, the Linnean system was created under fixism and is ultimately inconsistent with, with the uh, Darwinian uh, evolution, even though, even though we need names to talk about things. But what those names mean is uh, just uh, shorthands. And 
I would suggest that you, we need to forget about all of these uh, as species in the biological sense of the word and just uh, consider these as you know, shorthands for groups of fossils that are all part of the uh, evolution, our, our evolutionary ancestry. And uh, this uh, recent image uh, taken at in the International Space Station uh, is a uh, mature demonstration that uh, <laughs> uh, those folk uh, actually were not very different from ourselves. Uh, uh, to the extent that anyone living 40 or 50,000 years ago can be said to be like us. Uh, and one of the other things that I find extraordinary in these debates is the notion that one can speak about people who lived 50 or 100,000 years ago as modern. And uh, with that, I conclude and thank you for your attention. Our next speaker is Professor Teresa Garcia March. Uh, Professor Garcia March is a distinguished scholar with a remarkable academic journey. She is a full professor here at Ishba and the holder of a prestigious aggregation title from the University of Lisbon. Uh, she characterizes herself as a social, social cognitive researcher and is known for her mastery in statistics and experimental research methods. Her primary research pursuit revolves around the impact of emotions on cognitive processes, where she explores how various affective feelings, be it from familiarity, processing fluency, or mood, can influence cognitive function. Uh, within the realm of social cognition, her work focuses on fundamental co cognitive processes such as perception, attention, and memory, particularly in the context of social events. Her, her research extends to understanding the perception of truth, decision-making, uh, persuasive, persuasive contexts, and the formation of lasting impression. Uh, currently, she is focused on social facilitation effects and how these modulate cognitive processing. And as a, as a psychologist, she stu her studies has also focused on human creativity, uh, enriching our understanding of, her cognitive, of the cognitive mechanisms underlying divergent thinking processes. And so please help me welcome Professor Perez. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Roy, to, for inviting me. Thank you, Alex, to be here. Oh, we can go back. It's, it's, it's okay. It's, it's it's okay. 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 Um, so, uh, my talk will be really different from what we have been. I don't have wonderful pictures and wonderful uh, examples of how be the beauty of human creativity, but I will put some. Uh, images there just for fun, okay? Uh, not to support my my talk. So I'm going to talk about origins of creativity with a psychological perspective, okay? And um, for that, I will travel a little bit about ask uh, answer the question, what is this thing we call creativity? Then I'll go back a little bit for this conference uh, topic, the creativity in art and science. And then I will focus my main purpose on this talk is the thinking about the creative mind, the creative process, how our minds produce creativity. So there are many words and terms that are closed related to the concept of creativity, and you all use them. One of the things that we use in our life is to name a person. Uh, capacity of a creative person. She or he is creative. And there's a couple of research in psychology, or several research in, research in psychology that try to grab that distinction and trying to see if schizophrenics are more creative than other normal people and if uh, extroverts and introverts makes a difference to be creative. I'm not going to talk about that, but I be share my knowledge if somebody wants. What I want to understand is what we call creativity. And all of you, if I would ask one word, would come with this kind of words. Imagination, innovation, originality, inspiration, invention, uni uniqueness, novelty, and something like that. And when we are talking about these words, 
we are talking about a feature of the output of our behavior. Not the process of creativity, but the feature of the output, the innovation. We call something creative when he is more original. And when we talk about the process of creativity, we talk about words like inspiration, intuition, divergent thinking, brainstorming, the click, the insight, the spontaneous behavior. And here, we are talking the origins of creativity, where it comes from. And that will be my most, uh, the time I will take talking about that. And when we talk about creativity in arts, in science, in, in uh, uh, problem solving context, in technology, we are talking on domains where we exhibit those creativity. So, when we look to old research in, in creativity that psychologists develop, they start to define it around the output. So you can see that creativity is the ability to generate responses that are both novel, origin, and unexpected, high quality, and appropriate. So there is a useful in line into, uh, with the, ta the, the task constraints. And Stanberg is one of the most prolific researchers in creativity in, in our days. So creativity is associated with the output that is original and has a value. And both of these features are time and culture dependent. And because what was creative could be a creative move, movement I would do this moment, if I repeat it, it's not creativity anymore. We don't call it creativity. So it's time dependent. And, and it's culture dependent because it evolved with the standards of we call something new and creative or not. Take, for example, Picasso. He went to, uh, he saw all the pictures of uh, uh, sculptures in Africa, and he used it in our culture, and for us, it's really novelty. Perhaps for somebody in Africa, it wouldn't be not as novel as for us was when he presented his work, and use it in an original way. So I'm not taking credit. So creative, uh, the, this aspect of culture dependence make a lot of researchers talking about creativity as ideas that take the effort of changing our traditions, so our culture. And I recommend the work of those, that author that I don't know how to say the name, okay? He, has, he interviewed a lot of people in different areas of arts and science, and he came out with this, um, um, summary of what different types of creativity talk uh, inform us about this effort to change traditions. So, when we talk about art and science, what, where are these two features of creativity of the output? Where, it, where original is found in art and science? And in art, we are creating new realities. In science, we are trying to reveal the known about the world. So the creative, the creative thing uh, is in finding something that is already there. So in art, there is resonance with an audience on a subjective and emotional level. In, in science, the resonance with the audience is objective and at cognitive level. It maximizes subjectivity in art and uh, minimizes it in science. It doesn't want reproducibility in art, we don't want that, but we want it and we want to guarantee it in science. We have much more degrees of freedom because we don't have to be anchored in previous knowledges, so we, and we can embrace ambiguity and certain violations of logicals in art and we cannot do it as much in science. So art rises from self-expression aesthetic, emotion ideas, or narratives, and our um, output in science <coughs> rises from knowledge, competence, and consensus. So the originality uh, criteria is different in different areas. And what about the value? 
when we talk about value, and notice I could not put this in different areas, and you will understand why. We talk about beauty, aesthetic, parsimony accounts uh, as a concept, fruitiness, meaning, narrative, productive, cognitive resonance, and emotional resonance. And perhaps for you guys, you would say, oh, oh this is art, the, the value of art, or this is the value of science. But I guess that some of you don't know that aesthetic and beauty is a criteria in mathematics. So people use it as a criteria to see this is more valid because it's more beautiful, okay? And research in my area take, uh, shows that behind things like beauty, aesthetic, parsimony is always the same cognitive feeling or affective experience that is fluence of processing. So perhaps all that are the same things, but I'm not going to discuss that now. What I want to say is that when we study in psychology creativity, we don't think creativity is ability to find or discover a solution, and we don't think creative as art. We are objective in defining thing as creativity is generation of an output that is considered by others as original and with a value. And I found that in your research and your talks because it's a relationship with others. Others see beauty in my work. Others see creativity, understand creativity in our world because value with that. So when uh, we start to try to measure creativity in our studies and we have to evaluate creativity, there's a lot of difference from the beginning of the, the, the past center uh, um, proposals of how to measure creativity, and they were uh, measuring an output in those two criterias, originality and value. And then they used another one, that was flexibility, fluency. And all these tests that you can find in the textbook, uh, psychology textbooks, are texts like, can you think different things you can do with the brick? Can you think of how are your different things that you can do in your life if you had a tail, like a monkey? So can you come up with these ideas? So some people come with more and others with less. And because of that, they also have the criteria of fluency or flexibility of the amount of ideas people can come out. But they have to evaluate uniqueness. How do they do it? Usually, is to have others judging the output. And what about value? Also, others evaluating the output. So it's the relationship with the eyes of the others. And the, the, they use the social and cultural criteria we are used to, and we learn to. And the idea is because uh, all these tests are anchoring in one kind of way we think. And this is divergent think thinking, okay? And I want to tell you that division thinking is a way of thinking that we come from one idea and diverge from different outputs. And this is a different uh, way of thinking of finding a solution, okay? And in this, when we talk about division think, the, the uh, psychology literature considers this creativity. And usually doesn't consider cognitive thinking that's considered more problem solving. Although everybody recognizes that we need division thinking to find a solution. And so it's a dynamic process in some way. So let's go to the topic of my talk, and I hope I have time for that. This is to try to talk to you about what is the process behind creativity, where it comes from. And there are two cognitive processes that are, uh, ex help to explain diff and different models used to explain our, uh, our behavior in general and cognitive activity. One is activation, the other is monitoring. So activation is the random free flow thoughts, bringing diverse knowledge to our, our working memory or even to conscience. It's able to allow us to make new compositions with different information. Let me tell you this activation, chat GTP works more on activation. It doesn't have 
what they want to develop more, that is the monitoring system, the executive control that selects and approves the output. So the, we have a, a system that allows us to give outputs, whatever they are, they can out. But we have another one that helps us to think, is this original? Is this good? Is this beauty? Okay, that uses some criteria to evaluate original, originality and value. And there's a lot of theories in psychology that think we have an intuitive system and a rule-based system, and these two processes are anchored in those systems. And I'm not going to discuss this now, just to give you an idea that we have a associative memory, uh, we have a semantic memory, all our knowledge, that in some specific moment is activated. And so that part there with all the networks, it's information that is activated in a specific moment in our memory. What determines that activation? All the stimulus that are around us. You know that environment is very important for creativity. So where you are, it primes that what information will be pop out and be pre-activated in our minds. And also, what we want more in executive control function, demands, also can prone our memory and activate some information. So now we brought to our room of creativity everything we have in our storage, everything my mom asked, everything I remember I brought there and I can put it together in bringing to my working memory. But I would always check, is this a new combination? Is this aesthetic with different kinds of values? So if you understand what I'm saying, you understand the high relevance of prior knowledge. We understand that the prior knowledge define the set of information we are able to activate in our minds to be creative. We don't have an empty canvas. The creative process is based on our previous knowledge. Although the situation is not linear, and I can discuss that if you want. And our experience in general helps creativity. We have also some counterexamples that we like to examine and to try to understand better. But what we know is that semantic memory structures facilitates and constraint, constraints creative idea generalization. And also, it's our knowledge, a cultural knowledge, that defines the standards we use to evaluate. And as judges, I can look to a piece of art and say it's original, but you are the judge of yourself. Your executive memory is judging and say, this is fresh, I don't want this, okay? I I have to continue my work. So creativity is a dynamic process. It involves rapid switching between control and spontaneous process. It results from a dynamic interplay between activation and the activation of control. That's why people talk about very strong, strong. Deactivate control. Don't be critical. Come out with all ideas you want. After that, you have the selective process. So free association has been thought about being the window into unconscious mind because it activates all this kind of process. And the semantic regions, the content and interconnection of our semantic network impacts the quality and the quantity of the generate ideas. People have been examining and the most creative people are the uh, ones that interconnect parts of the brains or knowledge when we see network, semantic networks association, concepts that are really distant in their association. And if you can travel and put those together, you are more able to be creative. Also, all the studies show that if you deactivate control and we facilitate automatic associative process, we benefit creativity. So lack of cognitive control, decreasing filter of task relevant information, leaking or diffusion our attentions, leaking uh, sensory processing, all this facilitates creativity. But please remind that this is the point that 
uh, research forget a little bit for a while, is that that's not all. You need control process, goal setting and maintenance of what is why you are doing that memory activation. You, you need to be there uh, guaranteeing novelty and value and overriding all dominant responses. Because our brain is prone to give you what we better know in a context. So if I see a chair, I want to sit. That's the proper response. But that will not be the creative response. If I want to be creative, I have to overlap that. And for that, I need executive control functions that refuse my normal and adaptive response all the time. Let me only uh, give you one example of how this can and uh, uh, this frame help us to understand the uh, uh, known effects about creativity. You all have talked about that emotions influence creativity. Let me show, uh, 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 tell you that positive and negative emotions have different associative networks. Everything that is positive in our minds is overlap, you know. Uh, and it's common, and it's more common for everybody. That's why beauty, it's beautiful face is the prototype of a face, it's beauty, okay? Because everything is more prototypical in our knowledge, everything that is positive. By the contrary, negative emotions are more idiosyncratic and more dispersed. Think about emotions. You know a lot about names to give to negative emotions and only happiness to a positive emotion unless you use other criteria of emotions, but the most uh, basic ones. And also, positive emotions and negative emotions have different relations with control. Positive emotions relax control. It boosts quick creative idea generation. And negative emotions and everything that is ugly and, and difficult increases in anxious cognition and persistence. Okay? So there are several features of our mind that are obstacles to creativity and give us adaptation and help and also help us of creativity. Obstacles is that we our mind works and putting all the responses necessary at the specific moment for us to activate. And accessibility gives us our dominant responses. And we have to override that into creativity. Our mind is conservative. We are used to have a response and to activate it all the time. We have to overcome that. But that's the adaptive. For creativity, we have to overcome it. We don't uh, we don't like and avoid totally everything that is uncertainty, ambiguity, incongruence. But we have also helpers of creativity. We have our interconnected associative mind that we can overload, uh, 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 charge more, with more, more, more knowledge, create more and more connections by studying and practicing. We have an unconscious process that works free of our monitoring and control and so allow us to pop out in our mind different things. And our mind is also prone to solve ambiguity, uncertainty, and incongruence. And this, because we don't like, we find a way of having fluency, consistency, equilibrium when ugliness, ambiguity, and uncertainty is there. And that's also another form of creating, for example, art. So creativity is a historical, cultural, and social process, evaluative process, which has its origins in dynamic interplay of memory activation and monitoring process of our mind. So thank you for listening. much. I was, uh, I want to open this to, for everyone else, but before, before that, I was, I was looking at the three talks that you made, and definitely the 
connecting both these aesthetics. Everyone talked in one way or another about aesthetics. Either as a motivation to paint things on walls or as a motivation to attract a mate. And although I think Teresa didn't focus much on, on the aesthetic part, but more in the operationalization of what creativity is, uh, you also mentioned aesthetics in the, in the beginning of the. So I have a bunch of questions for everyone, but I won't, I'm not, I'm, I prefer to give it to the audience. I just want to kind of add a little bit of, uh, to this part, just because of the primacy effect. We, know, we have, I know we have uh, specialized circuitry in our brains to detect, not only about to evaluate things and to detect novelty. Because that's the point of our brain is to create uh, good models that are useful for us for, survi for survival. Uh, and so detecting something that is, does not fit our model is very important. And I found, I found it very interesting that that is the mechanism that not only we're talking about when we talk about creativity, but what we use to find interesting subjects. You look at the cave, you find a drawing, that's surprising. So that's why, why I want to go and investigate it. And also we use this in science as a way of evaluating scientific research, which is actually not not supposed to be creative, as you were saying, there's this dichotomy, which I'm not sure I agree completely, but there is this dichotomy between the uh, arts and the science. Uh, the most valuable paper is the one that is novel. Novelty is what every journal is requiring. For, you have to do novel things to be published in good journals. And uh, yes, reproducibility is, uh, is important, but the, the novelty adds value because it has the possibility of being a fundamental thing that you understand about the world. And so, I don't know, I'm, I'm just playing around with all of these, 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 these topics and I think it was very interesting. Um, I'm not going to monopolize this because I can't. So I would rather open it up to, to everyone who wants to ask a question. Or stand up and come eat. <laughs> I realized that prepared a very formal introduction and the goal of who at the beginning was to do the opposite and to make this more relaxed and, and a relaxed environment. Uh, but so, that's right. You've talked about beauty, aesthetics, and symbol sets, which are um, sort of buzzwords, both in cognition and in art practice. But for the last hundred years or so, beauty has not been an attribute of the visual arts. It's the anti-aesthetic that has dominated the discourse. Um, how would the anti-aesthetic fit into any of your practices? I, I, can, I can answer uh, at least. Uh, um, I think I have at least one answer, a couple of answers there. So again, it's probably the matter, the, 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 the matter of how we define beauty. If beauty is uh, uh, the meaning of beauty is to is to let's say conf to be conformed to uh, traditional accepted standards. Uh, but in fact, I mean, again, it's a matter of definition. This is why I don't like sometimes very much uh, like strict definitions because they they in some cases also uh, can uh, constrain creativity. Uh, I showed you at the very end of my talk um, this uh, the courtship display of the bowerbirds. Uh, something that I didn't say, hoping that the question will come. And uh, thank you for asking that uh, through the conversation. Uh, you probably heard that this they were making this very harsh sound, like it sounded like terrible sound, screeching sounds, whatever. Now the interesting thing is that these birds can sing beautifully, but they don't when they do the display. So even in this case, the uh, being attractive or being charming or being stimulating or being, uh, being cho chosen, it doesn't require to, to show like the, the standard natural beauty that these birds can show. They could sing beautifully they have, uh, like, you know, a, as any other songbirds. They are songbirds. But when they do display, they choose, they choose evolutionary. Of course, it's only intentional use. But they use these harsh sounds. We don't know why they do that, but this speaks a little bit 
uh, about the fact that sometimes you can evolve preference for things that are not like conforming to what we normally would call beauty. Can I? Can I add something? Yeah. Um, do you remember I told that the colleague of mine uh, study fluency and relationship with beauty and aesthetic? One of the things is that this feeling of easier process and feeling good because I'm understanding mm -hmm. what is there. It's um, it could come from the beginning, and but it's a relative feeling. So if you put it some hard, difficult in that, and then you have a pump, something you apprehend the, the everything, you understand the meaning you could send, uh, if your effort is successful in pr processing the content that is presenting to you, this card, piece of art, then you feel it much more fun. Then you feel much more better. So it's it, something that is ugly if you work on it and you find it with, uh, with a meaning it could be more fluent than the easiness, fluency coming from beauty that is the regular beauty we appreciate all the time with no cognitive effort to achieve the feeling. Well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? So, <laughs> um, I, I think that's the answer to your question. Uh, the, it is, uh, there, there is, um, there are probably some innate um, mechanisms and the neurologists and the cognition scientists here will probably be able to speak to that issue. <coughs> and that, that uh, predisposes to uh, like uh, pattern, certain patterns certain combinations of colors, whatever. Uh, but we are cultural animals, so uh, we are also conditioned by our environment to consider some things beautiful and others not so beautiful or ugly. And this may change with time and, and context, and etc. So you know, the, <coughs> the one thing I would you know, uh, comment on on what we you know, talked about this morning is um, I, I, I don't think this uh, dichotomy between uh, art uh, uh, being driven by uh, innovation, creativity, uh, and science being uh, about the search for consensus and, and, and norms and I, I don't think that works. Uh, the, um, I, I think consensus, the search of con for consensus is the opposite of science, actually. The, uh, what, 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 what drives scientists, in my experience, is, is finding out what does not work. Yeah. Uh, something odd here. Yeah. And then that's what prompts people to ask for. Uh, uh, investigate what, why is that odd, why this is this not working, and that's what prompts the, the start of an inquiry into some question. But also, uh, one thing that I have experienced in, as an archaeologist and uh, involved in, for instance, in, in, in uh, management, management of sites uh, for, for, the, for the general public, uh, there are things that are universal, you know, like when I look at a, a, a cave art painting or the open air with the, the petroglyphs in the Coa Valley, you know, I and sometimes I'm, I'm I'm there with you know just explaining or talking about these things to, to the general public. I I feel in my audience the exact same sensation of uh, awe. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that, that regardless of uh, the person being an artist, a scientist, or just you know. Not in a regular, ordinary member of the public, and you know, certain things have um, uh, the power to to impact our brains in ways that uh, 
uh, maybe someone in the audience will be able to explain, <laughs> but they just do. <laughs> I was just going to ask something similar and maybe comment on, on, on what was raised by Susan's question. That is, um, al although we were discussing creativity, there was a focus on aesthetics, uh, for example, in, in, in animals. Um, but there's creativity in animals in other domains, like tool use, and and um, and so when you have um, art that is not equated to aesthetical, so art that is beyond retinal art, as it has been called, that in, involves um, you know uh, conceptual thought and symbolic uh, you know cognition. Um, how does it work? So, uh, is there any connection between the two? If you go back evolutionary, speaking to other species or to Neanderthals and uh, early uh, sapiens that show any connection between you know creativity in domains that are not aesthetic because. <coughs> If you go back, so basically, if I understood well, the suggestion is that sexual selection explains the emergence of aesthetics, and then you can try to extrapolate it to other domains. But then there's, you know, uh, solving problems that are not merely perceptual; they have to do with, with cognition in, in different domains. So, would one thing be related to the other? Are these two different processes? I, mean, I, I can answer it, and I'd like to, of course, to, to leave space to, 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 to my colleagues. Um, two things. Uh, first of all, um, the first point about uh, going from, for example, to, uh, let's say, to arts, uh, as it was maybe until you know, 200 years ago, as also Susan mentioned. I was mostly, uh, let's say, focusing, maybe, I, I'm not like, I'm not an art historian, but maybe he was mostly focusing on, on like, uh, on representing like uh, the natural world and and things as close as uh, as they are to reality, and so you know, like perspective and like uh, anatomy, all these things improve like in, in, in figurative art in this sense. Now, very interestingly, when you have the process of like uh, going more to, towards abstract art, I think sometimes that we have. Uh, is uh, ignored an important uh, component. Mm -hmm. So I, I explained that with an example. I have a colleague in, uh, in, 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 in an Italian colleague who's uh, uh, studying, uh, is studying the, the, the minds in, their, like, in the moment of birth. He's studying that with chickens. <laughs> and, um, and the question is, uh, is not about art, but it's about how brains react to, to simple forms. And so we know that, for example, that uh, children and animals have a clear preference for like uh, heads, eyes, and, and a structure which is symmetrical. There is a preference, and it's innate because probably it makes sense that you know young animals and young women look go towards something that has a face because this is probably going to be like the mother, the father, right? Now, he, with this experiment, he showed that basically you just need to have two dots and a third dot in this point to have a face. So some of the process of going from figurative like arts to throw abstraction, in some cases maybe coincide with discovering the essential aspects which are hidden in the complexity of the world and discovering those traits and those fe features that make us appreciating or finding things uh, interesting and beautiful because we're able to, you know, to understand what is the, the under, underlying uh, features of, of these things. Well, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, I could, uh, there's a story I could uh, tell you. <coughs> and this is about, it has to do with the, the history of the, of the, I don't know if you're, all of you familiar with that, 
think it's just a long time ago. Uh, a long time ago, that's uh, almost 30 years ago. In this country, we have a, a controversy related to the uh, to whether a gigantic hydroelectrical dam being built in the Kola Valley in northeastern Portugal uh, would be allowed to continue in the context of uh, the discovery in that valley as the uh, construction work had already uh, was already quite advanced. Uh, that there was um, a huge uh, uh, open air rock art site that was not only huge and, and rock art, but it was also of uh, Paleolithic age. And they can see them. And that's it. Well, eventually, the uh, decision was made that the art was more important than, than the dam. Um, but the interesting thing is how. Uh, 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 people in the country, uh, in general, uh, this was considered the political event of the year 1995. So this was, you know, cover uh, page of the newspapers, opening news on television for almost a year. What what to do in this situation? And of course, everybody talked about it. And locally, there was a very tense situation uh, between, you know, the people involved in the, in the construction work, the uh, engineers, the uh, workers, local uh, uh, people, especially of uh, 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 an older age that would benefit by selling the land that which they were not using anymore to the, to the company building the dam, etc. And the people who, the, the, the archaeologists, and you know, especially the, 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 the local youth that were in favor of promoting the preservation of the, of the site. And um, as a result of that, one of the arguments and that was used uh, to, to deny significance or importance to the, to, the, uh, to the art was that it could have been, this is so simple, it could have been made by children. <laughs> this is not art. And this, this argument was used even at government level. <laughs> okay. um, and the, but this had, this had practical consequences because the, the, the issue was so, uh, it, 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 it impacted so much uh, uh, people's lives that you saw uh, 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 people in the, in the, in the, in the town for school. Uh, both locals uh, and engineers that were so um, uh, invested in the, in, the, in the idea that, you know, damage progress, etc., etc. Why, why should we stop this magnificent work because of things that could have been done by children? And so there was this drive for a while of people trying to replicate <laughs> what they, <laughs> what to demonstrate that anybody could have made them. <laughs> so you had in the in gardens, out in, the, in, in local houses, you had these schist plaques where, you know, people you know, would do their thing. And then there was a particular one engineer who, in, in, who almost went mad trying to, to <laughs> replicate <laughs> and never being able to do the same. And, and you know, you just don't see, it's not, it's deceptively simple. What this, this, why is these guys artists? Because they were capable of, uh, uh, of with, with, with one line, sometimes one line, maybe, maybe in, one, in one go, mm -hmm. but uh, deceptive, in a deceptively simple, simple manner. Uh, represent the essence of what they were seeing. And this is the most difficult thing to do. Uh, and, 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 this, uh, the, and eventually, as <laughs> people learn from experience, that children, and must be very gifted, <laughs> uh, this is not like, you know, children uh, doodles, but this was really, you know, uh, Artists in, 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 in the modern sense of the word, and people with, 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 with an ability that is uh, uncommon. 
uh, only people like that would be able to, to, to do that kind of stuff. So um, uh, I think this matches what Leo was saying, that you know, there's certain things that uh, uh, the, 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 the capacity to see the essence behind the, uh, or underlying or underpinning the, the detail and the richness, uh, sometimes takes precedence in forms of artistic representation. And you can see that, for instance, in the, in the, in, 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 in the, in the Epic Paleolithic, most art is figurative. And all the Holocene art is, is geometric or, or, or uh, what you see, for instance, the painted dolmens. Uh, it, it's all uh, uh, patterned, uh, like possibly representing uh, weaving patterns. And, and there's almost not a single instance of, of, of representation of animals or humans. That's, that would be called in today's terms, it's abstract art. Well, it's a form of communication that uses, uh, 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 uses um, a different, different <coughs> types of images. Uh, but they still, you know, they, they st they still, uh, uh, well, when you see them, you're, you're at the site and look at these things, you, you, this, you get the same impression. Uh, you, when you're in, there's a very famous painted dolmen in, in, in northern Portugal. You enter there, you see it. <coughs> you get the same, it impacts you the same way as, as, as it's an Altamira bison. Uh, and, but it's a different, completely different type of image. So it's, we, our brain is still gets impacted in a similar way. No. Why? Can I, I, do I have time to ask a question to my colleague? We're running later, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah? <laughs> Just because with our talk, it <coughs> became uh, clear to me that aesthetic and beauty is independent of creativity. Because your ber uh, birds are repeatedly some um, behavior, and um, there's not novelty there. They are not origin doing that. They are trying to maximize something that they know others are evaluating as beauty and aesthetic. Uh, or does this make sense? Or? Uh, where is creativity in that apprehension of beauty of a flower, of a bird? <coughs> I, had, I didn't have time, of course, to, to uh, you know, I had 20 minutes, so of course mm. I have to be selected. But in fact, uh, it is not exactly like that. First of all, and this is actually very interesting for our biological perspectives, these animals, these, these birds, like typically bower birds, birds of paradise and other ones, they become sexually mature at one year of age. So after one year of age, they adapt. But they do not really start displaying until they're seven years of age. It takes them seven years to become competent. So they're learning. They're, they're, they go and they visit a, a older males trying to understand, to learn. They progress a lot of, lot of practice. So every year they get better and better. So older males are typically more successful. So there is a a lot of progress. They, they, these are not stereotypes. These are not the kind of things that you press the button and automatic. First thing. And the second point is that, uh, so uh, you said about creativity, uh, and that there is always innovation, and, and there is always like uh, adopting things from, even from other species. There is a very well-known case where uh, this species of birds, like they were closer to another group of birds, would like to have blue things. You know, that they use these things to decorate. They put like uh, uh, green things, these, these birds. But in other species, do blue things. And in the area where they are like boarding with each other, the green, the green preferring birds look at the blue one and say, mm. they look kind of nice. Wow. And they start using the blue ones themselves. So there is also like uh, creativity in this sense, even in, in a single, like, uh, you know, in a single generation. So there is definitely uh, <coughs> The displays of these animals are not kind of automatic, stereotyped presentation always of this thing. 
So there's creativity and beauty apprehension in yes. some sense. Just a question. Is it possible that uh, through repetition, many small differences sometimes that are not possible for us to understand, but if we try to dismount ourselves, as we have our capacities and incapacities. Maybe it's uh, through repetition a, a true game of innovation on, on each individual bird, not judging the bird by uh, the same ritual, but finding within a ritual that is repeated uh, a huge dimension of individuality on each bird. Yes, and in fact, one of the reasons, uh, again, uh, for like uh, sake of brevity, I couldn't really speak about that, but one of the reasons for which I'm uh, also I'm convinced that uh, there is something more than the measurements of many different traits uh, in, in, in this uh, elaborate displays is that there is something which is called the lack paradox. So I told you that these uh, animals, uh, they have this system for which they, they, the males only do the show and they, there is no other contribution to the next generation. And um, if, you, if you're a farmer and you want to have big apples and you start, you take the trees making bigger apples and you cross them together and together, and this is what artificial selection is, and then you end up to have the biggest apples. And then, unless there is some mutation appearing in the population, you cannot make bigger apples, right? It's, it's the end. This is true for all the, uh, like, cultivar, all the, the vegetables and animals we have. After a certain point, you cannot go more, because variability is finished. In the lack animals, there is a paradox, because although females always prefer longer tails, there is still a lot of variability in the length of the tails. So what is the explanation for that? People have run have written enormous, complicated mathematical modeling to explain that. There have been many attempts for the last 40 years. Now, this work, it's very easy to explain if you think that it's not the preference for the longest, the strongest, the most colorful, but it's the preference for an equilibrated, well, harmonic, well-combined set of elements. Then the best males well, will not be the one with the longest tail and the brightest color or whatever, but we, we will be the one that has a, a nice, well-structured combination of the different traits. And then you explain the paradox. So this is, I think, that would be my answer to your question. Uh, there is not a single, there is not only objective beauty, there is also subjective beauty, and the objectivity is in maybe in, you, you have to be like uh, good enough in the different aspects, but then the subjectivity is that any combination is unique, and any specific combination would be preferred by that individual, but less by the other one. I have to cut this short. We are running half an hour late, and it's my fault. So we no no, it's my fault. I should have been more. Uh, we have a lunch break now until two p.m., and so we'll be back for a session on arts and science. How to rejoin both of them at two p.m. Shared by Pedro, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you.